Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome to The Amazing World of Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, tell it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. And check out our main podcast page, The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio at greatdetectives.net. Well, it's time to get our Christmas program going on the amazing world of radio and we're starting off with Grand Central Station. Grand Central Station was a very successful radio anthology series. It was on the air for 17 years from 1937 to 1954. Uh, bouncing around between uh, ABC, uh, NBC, and CBS. It started out on the Bloop Network, which was the predecessor to uh, uh, ABC. It was known for a couple of things. First, it was known for the great opening, which you're going to hear in a moment. And it was also known for its Christmas special, uh, starting in 1944. Every year they had a standard Christmas special that was very well beloved. And one of those uh, airings does survive. So we're going to take a listen to it. Uh, the original air date on this program is December the 24th, 1949. And this one is Miracle for Christmas. From New York, Pillsbury's Best Enriched Flour brings you Grand Central Station. great country are aimed at Grand Central Station, part of the nation's greatest city. Drawn by the magnetic force of fantastic metropolis, day and night great trains rush from the Hudson River, sweep down its eastern bank for 140 miles, flash briefly with the long and broad tenement houses south of 125th Street, drive with a roar into the twin one-half mile tunnel which burrows to the glitter and swank of Park Avenue, and then Grand Central Station, crossroads of a million private lives, gigantic stage at which are played a thousand dramas daily. Now, for the sixth consecutive year, Pillsbury Mills of Minneapolis presents with pride Grand Central Station's traditional Christmas play, a drama you will long remember. This is Galen Drake, and before we get into our Christmas story, I want to say just a word about the three top prize-winning recipes in Pillsbury's Grand National Recipe and Baking Contest. The grand prize was awarded for a recipe for Pillsbury's $50,000 no-need water-rising twists. The second prize of $10,000 was for Starlight Mint Surprise Cookies. And the third prize of $4,000 was for a chocolate cake, Aunt Carrie's Bon Bon Cake. Now, there's $64,000 worth of prize-winning recipes. Recipes won with Pillsbury's Best Flour. Now, as you know, you always bake your best with Pillsbury's Best, and, and we have those three recipes ready for you now, and we'll be glad to send them to you. You just drop a penny postcard to Ann Pillsbury, Prize Recipe Department, Minneapolis 2, Minnesota, and she'll send you your copy. Ann Pillsbury, Prize Recipe Department, 
Minneapolis to Minnesota. After the train from Albany pulled in, no one, not a single person, actually saw the young man with soft brown hair and soft brown eyes come through the gate. Still unseen, he walks the length of the great waiting room, now strangely tranquil as travel ebbs on Christmas Eve. Quietly, he goes out the door, down the street, and then up the broad marble stairs of the hospital. When the girl at the switchboard turns to him... What can I do for you, sir? Without saying a word, he gives her a card. She's startled by the name on it and instantly announces him to the hospital superintendent. Dr. Mason is here to see you. Mason? Dr. Mason who applied for an internship? Yes, Dr. Garrett, it is Dr. Mason from Albany. But that... but that's impossible. Shall I ask him about the telegram? No, no, no. No, I'll do it. Send him in, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Garrett will see you, sir. First door to the left. Dr. Garrett. Dr. Mason? You are Dr. Mason? I'm sorry that I was delayed, Dr. Garrett. But I... But just ten minutes ago, I... Yes. Ten minutes ago, you received a telegram. Why, that's right. I know. From your mother. I know. But, man, I... Why, look at it. It says that you... That I was killed. Do you mind if I tear up that telegram, Dr. Garrett? Well, I... I don't understand. I, I was so unnerved by that wire. I... I'd counted so much on your being here tonight, Christmas Eve, a night always busy with calls. You are short of interns. Oh, yes. Mason, these are the slums. Walk through block after block and you won't see a doctor shingle. Not one. The people here are too poor. They know only one healer, the intern and his ambulance. And tonight, night of mercy and goodwill, they would have cried out in vain. Well, now that you've come, I won't have to say to the suffering, wait. Wait. There's only one ambulance tonight, and that's out on a call. Wait and suffer. I have no one to send to you because Dr. Mason was killed. Ah, uh, uh, it's good that you're here, Mason. It, it's good. It's good to be here, Dr. Garrett. Well, you better get started. Take this slip down to the storeroom. See that they give you a warm sheepskin coat. Thank you. And a pair of mittens. From there, you go to the ambulance room. I'll have your driver waiting for you. His name is Mac. My name is Mac. The chief says I drive your crate tonight. Crate? Crate, jalopy, sick buggy, ambulance, take your pick. Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> you green interns, you're all the same. The first time you spy a ambulance, your eyes pop wide like you've seen a heavenly chariot or something. Not me. I've been driving this old baby for eight rotten years. An ambulance, Mac, is a sacred thing. It is a chariot of mercy. Uh-oh, two bells, that says... Come on, Mason, that's your first call. 234 South Street. 234 South Street. 234 South Street. Look, pal, help me out by watching out for cars cutting in at the cross streets. We don't stop for no red lights. Doc, what did I tell you? Watch it or we'll both be killed. Holy cow, you new interns. You're all alike. You're always dreaming. You put on the white coat and pants and your head goes up in the clouds. Why are you so bitter, Mac? Why shouldn't I be bitter? If it wasn't for you, I'd be home with the wife right now. You truly believe that only because of me... Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you hadn't showed up, this ambulance would be parked in the garage for crying out loud. I would have had the night off like on a decent job. To you, driving an ambulance is just a job like any other? Yeah, nothing but. Boy, will I be glad when the shift is over. But, Mac, this is Christmas Eve. You're telling me. This is one night at least you could forget that driving an ambulance is a job. This one night, you could look upon it as an errand of mercy. An errand of mercy? <laughs> you know where we're going? To help someone afflicted. Afflicted? 
Afflicted with alcohol, you mean? I'll give you two to one and we're making a stew call. Stew call? Yeah, mate. We're risking our next tearing through traffic to give some drunk a whiff of smelling sauce. Any man who cries out for help, whether he be brimful of drink or empty of blood, his call shall be answered. Yes, says you. What did I tell you? No good, Chuck. Here's your bag, Doc. Thank you, Mac. I won't need it. But he's out cold, Mason. Come on, give him a whiff of the stuff. Quick and we blow. Quiet, Mac. Come now. Open your eyes, sir. <laughs> because the drunk, sir. Look, ah! Mason, here's the spirit of ammonia. Hold it under his nose, will you? <laughs> that always wakes him up. Quiet, Mac. <sighs> Come, sir. Open your eyes. That's right, uh, Mason. You just talk uh, pretty to him and he'll open his eyes. Uh, where am I? <laughs> Why is everybody laughing? What's the matter? Nothing, nothing. Uh, just put your arm around my shoulder. Uh, That's it. Now, uh, let me help you to stand up straight. Uh, there. Now, you feel better? Why, I... Suddenly, I... I feel all right. I feel fine. My head is so clear. Of course, of uh, course. All you needed was to stand on your own two feet. To be strong. Be of good cheer. Gosh, Doc. That's... Sure, wonderful medicine you give me. Medicine? What kind of gag you pull and he didn't give you no medicine? There was nothing the matter with you. You toss off a beer and you lay down in the street like you're out calling. We waste an ambulance on you. I got a mind to take a poke at That'll you. That'll be enough, Mac. Tell me, sir, what is your name? Well, if it's all the same to you... Come on, I... come on, come on, come on. Give uh, me your name. He's got to make out his report. Pete Lantern, doctor... Peter, you won't lose faith again. You will stand up, self-reliant, and you will face life courageously and with new hope. Come on, Mason. You ain't got all night. Let's get going. Doc, Doc. Yes, Peter? Uh, a Merry Christmas to you, Doc. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Dr. Mason, Dr. Mason, I'd like to speak to you. Yes. Mason, Mac tells me you didn't even open your bag on your first call. No, it wasn't necessary. Well, now, don't misunderstand me, Mason. I, I can't begin to tell you how thankful I am that you're with us this evening, but... Uh, but from now on, I'm not to use suggestion. Or whatever it was you did use. Please follow standard materia medica in treating your cases. We... You're... you're not offended... Of course not. Oh, that's fine, Dr. Mason. That... Oh, that's your call again. Third floor. 19 Water Street, third floor. 19 Water Street, third floor. Well, Mac, you seem to be good at guessing. You were right the last time. What sort of call is this one going to be? It's no guessing, it's experience. This time it's no drunk. Oh? What do you think it is? A birth. Or maybe a debt. Christmas Eve. And someone is to live or die. It is better that one should live on Christmas Eve. Mac, let it be a birth we're going to. It's no difference to me, Doc. A birth or a debt. I just try. How long have you been doing it, Mac? Ah. Oh, like I told you. Eight rotten years, that's how long. What you call eight rotten years were truly eight glorious years, filled with service to your fellow men. Cut the chatter, Mason. This is it. Number 19 is Red Frick House upstairs. Come on, make a snap here. Third floor rear. Doctor! Doctor, here! Keep your shine on, we're coming. Even the glory. Doctor, 
tears on Christmas Eve, young man. I'm, I'm afraid you're too late. Uh, you thought it'd be a plenty of wrong, Mason. It sure looks Wait, like... Wait, Mac. Don't say it. No, no. Perhaps we're not too late. Tell me, how is the mother? She's all right. But our baby... Yes, your baby. Crippled. Terribly crippled. I... We prayed for our child to be born on Christmas Eve. We... We thought we'd be so happy tonight. Come now, come. No tears. Not on Christmas Eve. I'll have a look at the infant. Wait here, both. Make a snappy, Mason. That Garrett's always nervous when all the amulets are out. Uh, it's only nine o'clock. Hey, what's the idea of bringing a kid out here? Oh, but... Let me... Hold him, Doctor. Please. Of course. There. There you are. Ah, the child knows his father. Yes. He knows me. He knows me. But he'll hate me when he's old enough to realize it. Doctor. Yes? His arms... His arms. What about the kid's arms? They're straight. Straight as arrows. So what? But but before, they were terribly twisted. Both his arms were terribly crippled. You can see for yourself the child is normal. But, but I tell you, before, when I looked at... I swear they were twisted. And, and now... You were under great tension. Perhaps your imagination... Yes... Yes. Yes. Oh, my little son. Aren't his tiny fingers so tiny? <laughs> and now go in and tell your wife truthfully that her baby is normal in every way. Show her. Yes. Yes. We both look forward to a happy Christmas Eve. It is. Remember, tears are not for Christmas Eve. Hey. Ah, come on, Mason. Forget all that good fairy stuff. This fella's hopped up enough as is. Let's go. Yes, Mac. Oh, doctor. Yes? A, a, a merry... Merry Christmas, doctor. Thank you. A merry Christmas to you, sir. Mason! Dr. Mason! Yes, Dr. Garrett, you've been looking for yes, me. Yes, sir. 471 oh, um, Street. Oh, only one bell. Go on, Dr. Garrett. Well, I must speak to you, Mason, about, about the telegram. Yes? The telegram which said that Dr. Mason was killed. The one you said was a mistake. Did I, Dr. Garrett? I've just spoken to the sender of that telegram. I have just finished talking to Dr. Mason's mother on the long-distance telephone. That's my call. I'm sorry, I no. must go, Dr. Now, wait, wait, man, wait. I want to talk to you. Listen to me, please. Dr. Mason was killed. Do you hear? Three hours before you walked into my office, he was killed while driving to the Albany Railroad Station. And his mother saw him die. Well, Mac, what is this call going to be? Uh, uh, a birth or a death? I don't know, Mason, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like this one. There, 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 there's something about this call that... Give me a funny chill all of a sudden. Because it's in your neighborhood. Ah. Uh, what do you think this call is going to be? Because it is your wife. Ellie. Is this job a rotten job, Mac? Now that you can rush a doctor to her side? Is this ambulance still a crate? Now that it's speeding to answer your own wife's cry of pain? Stop that kind of talk, will you? You're trying to make me think something's happened, Ellie. 
I ain't afraid. So I'll say it again. Dad, driving this train is still a job and a bum one at that. And the eight years... Rotten years, wasted years. Could have had my own garage and repair business. I'd be in the chips today instead of... Yes, you would have made more money. Instead of risking my neck driving all night, twisting in and out of help pillars, skidding on slippery car tracks. Why, Mac? Why did you do it? How many times I gotta tell you that nothing in this whole cockeyed world could have kept me sitting back of this wheel, except my wife. If it wasn't for earlier... What's the matter, Mac? Ah, uh, nothing, I guess. That house we just passed, that was ours. And, uh, uh, the lights are on. Is that unusual? Ah, oh, no. Nah. It just means I ain't home. She, she, uh, is probably going down to the corner as far as the drugstore. Yeah, hell, he walks the dog there every night about this time. And, and... Yes, Mac? The call we're going to is that drugstore. Yes, Mac. Mason, you got a hunch what it is. Tell me what it is. It is not a birth, Mac. Let me through! Let me through again! Ellie! Ellie! It's Ellie Mason. Do something. You gotta do something. Please! Please! We will take her to the hospital, Mac. Let's get eight, ready. One, the two, next call row. will be ours. Eight, one, two, get ready. <laughs> yes, you heard. The other ambulance just went out. Are you crazy? My wife is upstairs in the operating room, and you expect me to leave the hospital? To go out and drive? There are people who need us, Mac. Our work tonight is not yet finished. But Ellie needs me. What do I care about other people? There are people, Mac, who will cry out for help, as your wife did. We will answer. Stop me. I ain't moving. It is Christmas Eve, Mac. Christmas Eve. What a Christmas present I got. <laughs> Six four West Street. It's our turn, Mac. Six four West Street. All right, Mason. Six but this four is West my last Street. trip for the night. No, not for the night. Forever. I'm through, do you hear? All washed up for good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, Mac. We did the best that we could. Dying? Ellie's dying? And I... She... She asked for you, Mac. Just once. It was while you were out on that West Street call. Then she lapsed into coma. Ellie? Ellie? Isn't there a chance, Doc Garrett? I... I doubt it. While I'm out with the crepe, my wife calls for me, and now she's unconscious. Think of others. Think of others, he said, because it's Christmas Eve. What are you going to say now, Mason? You took me from me. You made me go out and drive that rotten ambulance while she... She... <laughs> you went to help others. To bring aid to the suffering. A lot of consolation, that is. Remember how the old woman blessed you. With tears in her eyes. Oh... I can't think of nothing, but Ellie's gone. You with your big ideas and your fine speeches. What do you know about sorrow and suffering? All that there is to know, my son. Just, just, just now, when you, when you said that for a, for a second, you got old. You, you look more than a thousand years old. God. I must be seeing things on account Ellie is leaving me, and I'm crazy. Crazy with grief and sorrow. Grief and sorrow for you. Yet how much you did to relieve others of that pain. It, 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 it's funny, Mason, but... Yes, Mac? What... When when you said those words, I, I I thought of my eight years, the eight rotten years, and and they didn't they didn't they didn't seem so bad, not anymore. Now I I I I, I kind of like them. 
Sorrow worketh repentance. You should, Mac. You should glory in them. Eight years of bringing a healer, healer to the suffering. Eight years of rushing the torn and the smash to the hands of the mender. Yeah. Your words, they just, they just, they just take the pain right out of me. They, they just draw it out. Now that your work for this night is finished, Mac, I will walk home with you. Go home? While Elliot... <laughs> yes. Okay, if you say so, Mason. But for the life of me, I don't know why I'd take your word. What a break. What a rotten break I got on Christmas Eve. You love her a great deal, don't you? Yeah. Soon, it will be midnight. A merry Christmas. How did she greet you each night when you returned from your driving? How did Ellie greet... Why, why do you ask that, Mason? Tell me, Mac. I want you to say it. Well, she... Tell me. She, she's like a, like a happy, anxious kid. She, she'd go out and put on a porch light. Didn't matter even if the weather was terrible. I used to boil her out for it. Tell her she'd catch pneumonia. But, but she'd always put on a porch light and stand outside there waiting for... Waiting for her shining knight returning from his errands of mercy. As soon as she'd see me come around her next corner, she'd call to me. And now, will you continue your driving? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sticking to it, Mason. Even though Ellie won't be around, I, I'm sticking. This is your corner. Yeah. <laughs> Look to your house, my son. The light? A porch light, it's on. Mason! Your eyes! Mason! Mason! Where are you? Look to your house, my son. <gasps> no! It, it can't be! Mike! Mike! It's Ellie! Ellie, darling, it is you! Nice. Thank God! Thank God! And forgive me, I did not know who you were. You have just heard the sixth annual Pillsbury presentation of Grand Central Station's traditional Christmas drama. In a moment, I'll return with the names of the players who gave such an inspired performance. This is Galen Drake, bringing you a Christmas greeting from Mr. Philip W. Pillsbury, president of Pillsbury Mills. It reads, Throughout the entire world, this Christmas tide, families are gathered in prayer and festivity. Christmas started when a child was born into a family many centuries ago, and the families of the world have perpetuated the Christmas spirit. Fathers, mothers, sons, and daughters, united always in the hope that peace on earth, goodwill to men, will someday blanket the world. Only when the true spirit of Christmas stays with us every day shall we know the peace on earth that angels sang about so long ago. 
I extend a greeting to your family from the people who make up the Pillsbury family, and it's a big family. The farmer who plants the wheat, the employees in our mills and offices, and your grocer, baker, and feed dealer who carry our Pillsbury products. We at Pillsbury hope this Christmas will be a true day of joy, that there will be songs and feasting, a family gathered round the table, and a word of prayer, and above all, the laughter of children. For it's the children who will keep Christmas always the day of love and understanding. Signed, Philip W. Pillsbury. Our play, Miracle for Christmas, was written by Jay Bennett. Our stars, Mason Adams as Mac and Ralph Clanton as Dr. Mason. Gilbert Mack was featured as the young father, Walter Grise as Dr. Garrett, Madeline Pierce as the baby, with the music by Lou White and Burley Mills. Next week, the tender, affectionate drama of the young reporter whose human interest New Year's story never got printed because instead of writing it, he lived it. Our cast is headed by the three top featured players of Broadway's smash hit, Death of a Salesman, Cameron Mitchell, Mildred Dunnock, and Howard Smith. Now, this is your Grand Central Station narrator, Ken Roberts, wishing you, for all the Pillsbury folks, a very Merry Christmas. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Stay tuned for Stars Over Hollywood. It's 1 p.m. White Rose Tea Time. Feeling droopy? Perk up with White Rose Tea. Welcome back. A heartwarming story, and I can see why it was so successful uh, during the golden age of radio. There are some beautiful moments uh, in the course of the story. That doesn't mean the story was without problems. Uh, there were a couple of things, such as when the other doctor found out that Dr. Mason wasn't who he seemed to be, uh, he never followed up on it, and it was never explained why he didn't follow up on it. And then the ending with the wife being at home was a bit puzzling how that worked out. Though I think there's maybe some emotional logic. I think one of the big thrust of the story was to get the ambulance driver, to uh, Mac, to really uh, change his attitude about his life, about everything in his life, and to understand uh, how precious it was, rather than uh, just being cynical and angry about his lot in life and resenting what he didn't have. And that final scene and his changed reaction to his wife's actions and greeting kind of signified the change that he'd gone through throughout the story. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you listened last year, you'll recall we brought you four different episodes of different old-time radio programs. This year, we're only going to bring you two. Um, now, the programs we brought you last year, they contain comedy and music and inspiration. How could we manage to fit all of that uh, that we provided you in four uh, programs into only two. Well, what if one of them was a big show? And you'll get to find out what I mean on Tuesday. Uh, in the meantime, though, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net uh, and follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.